Sad. <laughs> Good, morning. Good morning. Oh, I feel happy now. <laughs> Take your Bibles and turn to Mark chapter 4. Mark chapter 4. We're going to focus on verse 35. Verse 35 through 41. The title of this morning's message is, What Shall I Fear? Or, Why Am I Afraid? Why are you afraid this morning? Are you afraid this morning? Do you find yourself worried at troubles, worried about the things of this life? This text brings great comfort to the believer. Starting at verse 35. And the same day, when the evening was come, he saith unto them, Let us pass over unto the other side. And when they had sent away the multitude, they took him, even as he was in the ship. And there were also with him other little ships. And there arose a great storm of wind, and the waves beat into the ship, so that it was now full. And he was in the hinder part of the ship, asleep on a pillow. And they awake him, and say unto him, Master, carest thou not that we perish? And he arose and rebuked the wind, and said unto the sea, Peace be still. And the wind ceased, and there was a great calm. And he said unto them, well, Why are ye so fearful? How is it that ye have no faith? And they feared exceedingly, and said one to another, What manner of man is this, that even the wind and the sea obey him? Let's pray. Our gracious Heavenly Father, Lord, as we open your word and read your word this morning, Lord, we thank you, Lord, for even having this freedom to do so. Lord, I pray that you'll be with us this morning, Lord. Open our hearts to receive your word. Give me strength to preach your word, Lord. I give thanks to you for all that you've done. In Jesus' name, amen. Brother Michael, is he back there? Mm. Is he? Will you turn me up? Thank you. Still down a little from this morning. It says there were two boys who were notorious for causing trouble in school. And the principal was at his wit's end with these two troublemakers. And after much pondering, the principal finally came up with a plan how to deal with these two troublemakers. He set them down outside in the hallway and called the first boy into his office. And once he was alone, he shut the door. The principal thought that he would try to discern where these two boys stood spiritually and maybe that he and maybe the problem was that he and his trouble making friend really needed in Jesus and maybe it wasn't another round of after school detention so the boy walked into the office and he sat down nervously in the chair a face looking so stern at him the principal asked him in a very serious and a very controlled voice young man son do you know where God is. At first, the question didn't seem to register with the little boy um, because he just stared back at the principal with a blank look on his face. And the principal asked him again, this time with an even more stern tone, to his voice a little less controlled, son, do you know where God is? By now the boy was frightened, his little heart was beating rapidly, and sweat began to run down his back, but still the little boy said nothing. Exasperated, the principal asked the question one more time, but this time the principal was completely angry, no more of a controlled voice. Young man, do you know where God is? At this time, the little boy jumped out of his seat, ran out of the principal's office, and sat down next to his friend in the hallway. His friend asked him, what did the principal say? What did he say? What's going on? The young man with a terrified voice responded, God is missing, and they're trying to pin it on us. (laughs) You know, as as humorous as that is, it's only humorous because we're sitting here today And because of God's grace, we know exactly where God is. And we know exactly that he's standing upon his throne in heaven. But this morning, in this text, we 
about troubled disciples who are completely struck with fear. And they're so struck with fear. They're so overwhelmed about the situation that they begin to cry out, where are you, Jesus? Do you even care that we're about to perish? Do you even care that we're about to die? Do you even see the situation that we are in? They were so overwhelmed because they thought in this trial, in this trouble, in this situation, they had really began to believe that God was missing. And even worse than that, they began to believe in their own hearts that God didn't care about their personal situation. One of the most nervous times in our lives is when we're going through troubles, when we're going through trials, when we're going through situations, and we pray and we ask God to help us, and we ask God to strengthen us, and we ask God to give us wisdom, and we go to sleep, and we wake up the next morning, and we're still facing the same battle, and we feel like God has not heard our prayers. We feel like that God hasn't answered our prayers, and we begin to go through in our mind, God, do you care? Do you care about this situation? I've prayed time after time. And what happens is in our own lives, when we pray and we pray and we pray, it brings about seasons of doubts. It's amazing here how they go from a moment of, I can't take it any longer, to being struck with even greater fear than the storm. And that's just how, this is exactly how this account ends. They're so overwhelmed by this storm in their life. They're so overwhelmed about the obstacle that's in front of them. Matter of fact, the storm that's in their life, they believe that it was going to take their very life. Yet when we end this story, they are struck with even greater fear when they realize that they are in the presence of God the creator when they realize that they are in the presence of Jesus the one who has control of it all oftentimes when we find ourselves in this very same situations battling storms battling trials battling troubles the very thing we forget is the cure to the situation. We forget that we are not alone. We are in the very presence of our creator. It says, and they feared exceedingly and said, what manner of man is this that even the wind and the seas obey him? What manner is this? Did they really believe that he was gone? And did, you, did they really think that he didn't care? And that's where they were, and they transitioned from there to, did you just see his power? And that's all that could be said of the disciples. After the great manifestation of power, what manner of man is this? In this moment, the Lord calms the storm. I hope you know this morning that as a child of God, there is no problem that you will experience in your own personal life. And there is no trouble that you will experience in your own personal life that Jesus will not be the answer for peace. And there's no trouble that can be brought down to your life where Jesus cannot provide peace. This morning we have left the parables as we're, as we're working through Mark. And now we're reading an actual account of what something happened on the the Sea of Galilee. I hope that so far you've been working through the studies of Mark that you've been astonished by Jesus, that you've been amazed by Jesus, and that you've been awestruck about the power that rested in the Lord Jesus Christ, our Savior. If you're not amazed by all that we've worked through now in Mark, it may simply be because you just don't know him. If you know our Jesus, you can't help but be awestruck and amazed about all that he has done. The man that we read about here in this text, Jesus, God in the flesh. We see both sides as we enter into this text. In one person, we realize that he is 100% man. 
In the next text, we realize that he is 100% God. When he first enters into the ship and we see as the storm's coming on, where do we find Jesus exhausted from a day of ministry, sleeping in the ship? And in the very next step, we see that he's 100% God as he commands the waves and the seas to cease. But still God, he's still God. And from the spoken word, that's all it took to calm the storm. He's a hundred percent man in our own personal life. Isaiah calls Jesus the man of sorrows. He knows our griefs. He knows our sorrows. He knows what it, be, needs to, what it means to be stricken. He knows what it means to have grief. And yet, he is a hundred percent man that he can understand all that we feel, all of our emotions, all of our burdens, but in the same breath, he's a hundred percent God that in those moments of grief, in those moments of being struck down, in those moments of being cast down, that he can bring peace to our lives to remind ourselves of where we are in this setting mark chapter 4 and verse 1 this is all a continuous day we've already worked through three different parables that the lord was giving this day when we opened up in mark chapter 4 and verse 1 we seen all the disciples were on the ship and jesus began to teach right there on the coast of the sea of galilee and as the multitude was there he began to teach to them and deliver truths to them and he delivered the very parables that we we've already covered and now we see in the same situation that all these little ships were now surrounding him the, the the people that were listening to him was not only the ones on the shore but they had begun to crowd him in the ocean to kind of give us a geography of what this would have looked like in this time the good news is it still looks this very way today the Sea of Galilee, which is about 700 feet below sea level. It is the lowest freshwater lake on earth. Why is that so important? Because of its sitting, it is surrounded by all of these steep hills and mountains and valleys and gorges. And between those mountains can funnel air from the Mediterranean Sea and off of the desert. And what does that happen? The same thing that happened during this time still happens today. Out of nowhere, everything looks good. But because of these two air climates meeting each other out of nowhere, violent storms can erupt. It still happens even this day. And this would be the situation that would soon arise. And this is the setting that Mark is giving an account for here in Mark. Actually, as we said in the beginning, when we first started Mark, we realized it's action-packed. He's always building up to these great moments. He's ministering, he's preaching, he's teaching. And as the day is going on and on and on and on, and all of a sudden, in this very moment, we see this outpouring, this manifestation of God God's amazing power on this day as he delivers the parables and the seeds is now coming to an end mark chapter 4 and verse 35 says and the same day when even was come evening has now come now the the day is coming to an end all the teaching all the preaching they are exhausted they are physically fatigued and the Lord makes the request to go to the other side. And this is where ministry was taking them, to the other side. And that is how ministry works. And we sing the songs, right? Where he leads me, I will follow. And so the disciples did. The Lord wanted to go. Let us pass unto the other side. And so the disciples followed the Lord's call. In verse 36, and when they... And when they had sent away the multitude, they took him as he was in the ship, and there also with him other little ships. I hope you've seen it here. And there was also with him other little ships ships. Well, why is this so important? And because the emphasis is on around this ship that the Lord is in is other little ships. It gives us a, a clearer understanding as we truly understand the size of the ship that the disciples are in and we understand the size of the small ships around us. It makes us realize that this wasn't just a day of choppy waves on the sea. And this wasn't a day for rough wind. They were in a sizable ship in the storm 
was great. It was more than sizable. And listen, when we really can emphasize and, and draw attention to the size of their ship, we'll understand the size of the storm. And when we understand the size of the storm, we'll really understand the power that rests in our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And we understand here now how fierce this storm was. We'll fully understand this power that's displayed here. And when we fully understand that, we will see why the disciples were not only in fear of the storm, but even more when they said, what manner of man is this, that even the wind and sea obey him. It seems that all that they had already seen, we've covered so many different miracles already. So many different mighty works that Jesus has already done. Yet this miracle, and yet this mighty work of God's power is what blows their minds. They couldn't even understand the power that was resting in him. Do you understand the power of the storm that was laying upon them? It was far beyond their understanding. They'd already seen Jesus heal the lame. They'd already seen Jesus cast out demons. They already seen him do so many mighty works. But this, this miracle right here left them dumbfounded. Listen, when they seen this miracle, what manner of man is this? In verse 37, we see the peril that awaited them. The storm that awaited them as they followed the Lord. Before we get there, did you see it? Did you see how this just unfolded? How this situation just came about? The Lord said, let us pass over unto the other side. It was the Lord's ministry it was the Lord's decision to move the ministry elsewhere. It was the Lord's decision to take the ministry some six to eight miles across the sea to the other side. They were already in safety by the shore. They already had a multitude there to listen to Jesus teach and preach. And there were already people all surrounded all around them in little ships to listen to him as he preached. His popularity had grown so much that people were thronging him and crowding in just to hear him. Why would you leave this ministry now? Why would you leave this moment? Why would you walk away from this? Look at all those are here to hear you. Yet the Lord said, let us go over to the other side. And what does that say to us today? What that lets us know today is that you may be exactly where God wants you. You may be exactly in the will of God. You may be ministering like you've never been ministering before. You may be preaching the gospel like you've never preached before. You may be, you may be in this very moment more faithful to God than you than you've ever been and yet in this moment of faithfulness in this moment of being sold out in this moment of preaching the word like you've never preached before experience a storm like you've never seen before experience troubles like you've never experienced before and not because you're out of the will of God but while you're in the will of God facing troubles like you've never experienced this is exactly what happened to the disciples. They heeded the word of God. They went on to the other side. And yet while they are in the will of God, they experienced troubles like they could not even explain. You mean that they followed the Lord's leading? And well, yes, they followed the Lord's leading. But just because you're following the Lord does not mean that you will not face afflictions. It does not mean you'll not be troubled. It does not mean you'll not experience loss. Being in the will of God does not mean that you should not expect troubles. It means that you should expect troubles. Well, I can tell you, and we will soon see this with the disciples, how bad this storm was. They believed it was the end for them. But listen, in the storms of life, in the storms uh, in serving the Lord, in these moments, if we will just put our eyes upon the Lord, we will learn more about God than we had ever known before. Matter of fact, the psalmist said in Psalms 119.71, he said, it was good for me that I have been 
afflicted, that I might learn thy statutes. What the psalmist is saying, you know what? When everything was good, when everything was fine, it was good and fine. But when I became afflicted, when I was experiencing trouble, when I was experiencing sorrows and grief, when I was experiencing the afflictions of this life, after I came out on the other side, I can say it was good to go through the situations because when I came out on the other side I didn't have a deeper grief of the affliction I had a deeper understanding about who my God is it was good to be afflicted listen when we go through the troubles and trials and sorrows of this life if we will just focus on the God who's in the storm if we will just focus on his presence in the storm when we come on the other side of the trials and troubles do you know what we will find we will find a deeper relationship and understanding with our God. We're going to learn a whole lot more about him. Also to remind ourselves about these men. Where did, these Lord, where did our Lord call these men when we first came into Mark? Where did he find four of these men? Peter, James, Andrew, and John. He found them down by the shore of the Sea of Galilee. What does that mean to us? It means that these men were not novices. This is where they grew up. They were fishermen by trade. They understood what it meant to be on the Sea of Galilee. They understood what it meant to be in bad weather. They understood what it meant to experience choppy waters, to labor upon the waters. They understood it all. It was second nature for them to have oars in their hands. They understood what sailing meant. And they knew what rough water was. By all means, even today, as I said, the Sea of Galilee is known for these extremely rough weather. But as the Lord said, let us go unto the other side. He wasn't calling novices to take them there. These were men who were very experienced in their trade. They were fishermen. Many of us here work jobs, and I know we may, some of us will make, may work trade jobs or whatever we do in our jobs. And you know what happens with redundancy? As we're more redundant during our jobs, we always say, man, uh, when, when somebody comes and we start to train and we forget you know, how redundant we are in doing our work. And when we have to train somebody, we're like, whew, man, are these people ever going to catch on? It's like frustrating, but you don't realize how much you know. And oftentimes we tell people who we're training, like, look, I just try to catch up. I know this place like the back of my hand. I, I know this job like the back of my hand. And this is exactly how I see the disciples. When the Lord said, let us go unto the other side. And this was probably just another day for them. Oh, there's another moment. I've crossed this sea many times. And I know this lake like the back of my hand. And as they crossed over the sea, they probably thought nothing of it. It, it was just another day of doing a job they had done a hundred times but when the storm arrives a storm like they have never seen it all changes in church we may take for granted oftentimes the peace that we have in our lives but we may realize and we need to realize that just because our life is going good today and just because we have peace in our life today and just because we couldn't imagine it being any better and by the way some of you in your own personal life can say I wish it would just go a little better maybe in your own personal life you're already in the storm you're already Already going through the trials you're already lost in the storm trying to find a way out listen for us today in the church though my emphasis is to say that we need to realize that just because things are good today doesn't mean we should become relaxed just because we go to the same job we've been going to for the last 10 years don't become so comfortable in doing your redundant work day in and day out that you actually start to think that you do not need God's help in doing the redundant work. And this is where the disciples were. It was just another day. I've done this a hundred times. I'm just crossing over the shore. They had totally taken for granted the work that was put before them. And listen, it was when the storm got really bad that they turned to Jesus. I wonder how many times we're so redundant and so mechanical in the work and the things that we do that we wait till things are totally a catastrophe before we ever cry out to the Lord. 
we'll see from these fishermen. And when they're experiencing the storm, it's when they were fatigued. And it was out of nowhere that this storm comes. Listen, it was after a long day of ministry that they experienced this storm. A long day of ministry. They had literally spent the whole day laboring for the Lord. And now this. It was, it was going so well. I mean, we were telling them multitudes about Jesus. Multitudes was seeing the power of our Savior. And this is a great day. And yet after all of this goodness in this multitude, seeing our Lord and Savior, now I'm experiencing a situation that may cost me my very life. Oftentimes with believers, when we experience some of the woes or, or, or the C word in our life, and this is the mental thought process. Haven't I served you? Haven't I labored you for you? Haven't I tithed faithfully? Haven't I done all of these things for you, Lord? And now you're going to allow this storm in my life? Now you're going to allow this situation in my life? You're going to allow me to experience cancer? I may die after all that I've done for you? It's foolishness. The Lord is going to draw it out here for the disciples in this very last verse. When he asked them, why are you so fearful? What's the next thing he asked them? Why is it that you have no faith? Storms do not only come for pastors or Sunday school teachers or preachers. Storms come for all. And for this day, it had come for the disciples. A long day of labor, a long day of ministry. And now what they believed that was a situation that was preparing to take their life. Notice the peril. And there arose a great storm of wind, and the waves beat into the ship, so that it was now full. The text says, mm, so that the ship was now full. Remember, this is not a tiny little ship. And the ship is now full, not full of fishermen. The ship is now full of water. How scary you may think that is. How scary it was for the disciples in this situation. And truthfully, though the disciples' ship was full of water, they should have been the ones most peaceful. And they should have been the ones most relaxed. And they should have been the ones with the most faith. Their concern should have been for the ones in the little ship who didn't have Jesus in the boat with them. But in this moment, they have totally drawn their attention away from the fact that the God who was there on the day when it said, in the beginning, God, the, the creator of all, the power that rests in Jesus Christ in the flesh, and in all of those miracles, how the storm has the ability to distract them from Jesus and turn it solely and wholly upon the storm. You know, we we say and we, we, we like to remind ourselves and we tell people how good Jesus has been to us. The mighty work that he's done on Calvary, how he saved us from our sins, how he's there with us day by day, moment by moment, but how it is too, we are no different than the disciples. When the storm comes, when the trial comes, when the trouble comes, it has a way, if we do not remain faithful to the Lord, it has a way of drawing our attention off of him on to the situation that was at hand. The storm now arose. The, the, the ship was now full of water. Remember the promises that we have today. The promises that we have today says, And lo, I am with you always, even unto the end of the world. Amen. We are not guaranteed an easy passage. We're guaranteed his presence in the passage. We're not guaranteed grace from the fire. We're guaranteed grace in the fire. The ship is full. It is in danger. It's now sinking. What will we do? There is a great peril. But notice the peace of our Lord in verse 38. Our Lord was fast asleep on the ship. Oftentimes we exhaust ourselves, we push ourselves to our very limits, and we say, man, when we worked a hard day, when we labored a hard day, we get home and we lay down and we fall asleep, we wake up the next morning, and I always tell my wife, I say, I didn't even move an inch last night, meaning that there was nothing that was going to wake me up. I didn't hear nothing because I was so physically 
exhausted. And this is kind of how I see the Lord right now, exhausted, depleted from all of this ministry. We've already seen him just in the chapter three. He was missing meals to minister the word. And now another day, he is fast asleep in the ship. By the way, just as a personal note, this is the only time that we read about Jesus sleeping, though we know he slept. Most of the time when Jesus is mentioned and referenced to sleep is that he didn't sleep that night, that he stayed up all night praying. So this is the only time that we really see that Jesus is now asleep. He's sleeping, verse 38, and in the, he was in the hinder part of the ship, asleep on a pillow. And they awake him and say unto him, Master, carest, not that, not, carest thou not that we perish? The Lord is at peace sleeping. But here is a dangerous presumption of the disciples. It is that he doesn't even care if we die. He doesn't even care if we perish. A danger in the life of the child of God uh, can cause us to forget the miracles that he's already done. It's oftentimes, it's not the storms that cause us problems. It's not the trials that cause us problems. It's not the tragedies that cause us problems. It's somehow that we develop in our mind that as we're weathering a storm, that Jesus doesn't even care about what's going on in your life. That he doesn't even care about what you're facing that he doesn't even care about what you're up against oftentimes i think that people make ease of blaming god for their issues instead of turning to him and requesting help in the storm listen their unbelief brought about fear unbelief brought about questioning unbelief gave satan a foothold that this could be it this could be the end of our lives or if they would have just turned to him and cried to him sooner, how much peace they would have had. I wonder why they waited so long to cry out to the Lord. Why did they wait till the ship was full? Why did they wait till the very last moment when they thought, this is it? Why did they wait till that very last moment to cry out to God? And I often wonder about us in our very own lives. I was reading an article the other day about Wednesday night prayer meetings. It is said, when I don't know it to be true, but it was said this, that oftentimes when people arrive at Wednesday night prayer meetings, they love to raise their hand. They love to give requests. They want people to pray for the things that they're concerned about. Yet in the same breath, that oftentimes the things that people raise their hands and request prayer about, they have never prayed about in their own personal life. They've never bowed the knee. They've never cried out to God. We, we give prayer requests and say, please cry out to God on my behalf that the Lord will hear my prayer, that the Lord will hear my request, but have never committed to cry out to God themselves on, on their own behalf. This is where the disciples, you know, they're sitting here. They're waiting till the very last moment. Like, this is the very last possibility. This is the very last opportunity to cry out. And maybe our Lord can save us. Why do we do that in our own personal lives? It's not that we should wait till the very last moment to cry out to God. It's that we should cry out to God from the onset of the trouble. The ship was full. They were exhausted from trying to get the water out. Why did they even let themselves get there? It was the Lord that called you into this service. It was the Lord that told them, let us pass over on the other side. It is the Lord that has saved us. It is the Lord that has called us in ministry, even in your day in and day out at work. Why would you ever try to rely on your own skills to handle the voyage from the day we are saved and never forget those who journey and from the day we are saved for saved we must never forget whose journey this is never forget that we are on a journey to the other side it doesn't matter if your journey is a journey of working a trade to get there it doesn't matter if your journey is a, a journey of preaching the word a minister a missionary whatever your journey from the moment you're saved you are on a journey to the other side from the moment you're saved, when God calls you into ministry, you are now on the trail. You are now on the ship sailing to the other side. 
everything that you do from the moment of setting off to the shore from that first calling until we reach the other side will be done for him, counts for him. It's laboring for him. We are to be lights for him, sowing the seed for him. And this is what we are supposed to do. But in the promise, from the setting off of this shore until we get to the other side, there is no guarantee for safe passage, but yet we're still ambassadors. I love that song that Annie Hawkins wrote. I need thee every hour, most gracious Lord. No tender voice like thine can peace afford. I need thee, oh, I need thee. Every hour I need thee. Oh, bless me now, my Savior. I come to thee. It's not that we need him just in the storms. It's that we need him through this whole journey. We literally need him every hour. Never let the foolishness of our own minds and the comfort in our job allow us to get to a place of total collapse before we look to him, before, before we look to him and cry out. But when they came to an end of their power... They came to the end of their abilities. They cried out to the master. Why do we wait? Why do we wait to cry out to him in our own voice? We sometimes, sometimes get so frustrated. Lord, don't you hear my prayer? Don't you even care? Do you even care if my loved ones go to that place called hell? I've prayed for you. I, I, have I not worked? I've cried out, Lord, I'm battling and battling, and yet the storm is really raging in my life. Lord, things were going so well, and now this. I've been laboring so hard for you, and now this. I feel like I'm at an end. My ship is filling. I'm out of hope. I feel like the ship is going down. Take courage this morning and this text also confirms to us when we cry out to the master he hears our voice he knows exactly where we are he knows the exact storm we're in he knows our exact concern he knows our exact problems and he knows exactly who calls out to him notice the power of the lord in verse 39 and he arose and rebuked the wind and said unto the sea, Peace be still. And the wind ceased, and there was a great calm. The wind and the waves flooding in, and then a moment of peace. Peace is something that so many troubled souls in this world long to have. But notice our Lord's method here. He first rebuked the wind, and then there was a great calm. Listen, oftentimes people in their own personal life, they, when you talk to people who are troubled, when you're out witnessing to people, you often hear it like, I would just love to have some peace in my life. I, I'm just struggling to find peace. You know, this is why I find myself doing these things, because without them, I do not have peace. Notice the way that the Lord rebuked this here. Notice how the Lord first brought peace here. He rebuked it, and then the peace came. The reason that oftentimes that people are unable to find peace, the reason that oftentimes the people who are in the world are unable to find peace is because they are unwilling to rebuke the sin. That's causing them the trouble. And this is the method for peace that's come. And they're unwilling to rebuke the sin that's causing the storms. They just say, hey, this is what helps me to find peace. Lasting peace can only be found in Jesus. And he said unto them, why are ye so fearful? How is it that ye have no faith? The saying goes that if we have no faith, if the saying goes if we have fear, we have no faith. If we have faith, we have no fear. And this is to say that, oh, why are you so afraid? And don't you have any faith in me? And don't you have any faith that I am the Son of God? You have already seen me do these miracles. You have already seen me do these great works. And now in this very moment, because it's your personal trial, and because it's your personal trouble, you become you began to think that the Lord doesn't even care. You think that he doesn't care about your specific situation. I suppose the question could be easily asked to us today. Why are we so afraid today? What causes us to get so worried? What causes us to get so stressed out? Do we not have any faith? 
Do we not believe that we serve the Lord? Do we not believe that Jesus is exactly who he says he is? Why are we so stressed out about the things of this life? Why do we allow the things of this life, the afflictions that we experience in this life, stop us from serving the Lord? Don't we trust him? Don't we have any faith? Don't we believe that he is truly in us? Do we not believe as his child that we are truly in his presence? Do you really believe that God cares about you? He says he does. His word says he does. He's brought you this far. But because this situation is too much for us personally, we totally negate everything that God's word says about who he is and who he is to us and become overwhelmed with stress and worries and woe. That is exactly what he says. And he said unto them, Why are you so fearful? How is it that you have no faith? The Lord is with us. Yes, 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 the Lord is with us. I hear you that the Lord is with us. No, brothers and sisters, the Lord is with us. He is with us in this very moment. The one who, the one who creation, the one through whom creation came about. The one who calmed the sea. The one who cast out demons. The one who died on Calvary's tree and secured our salvation. The one who rose again. Do you know that the power, do you know who has the power to do all is the one that is with you? He tell, the first 41 tells us what the disciples did when they realized it. See, up to verse 41, they didn't even realize, they didn't fully grasp, they didn't fully harness about who this Jesus was. In verse 41, for the first time, they took in the power that rested in our Lord. In verse 41, it says, and they feared exceedingly and said one to another, what manner of man is this that even the wind and the sea obey him? What manner of man is this? They were afraid. They didn't even know what to say. What manner of man is this? How that the wind and the sea would even obey? You know what we just seen? You just seen the Creator speak. You remember the Roman soldiers as they crucified our Lord and the earth began to shake. The Bible says as the earth began to shake, they were afraid. Why? Because there was a manifestation of God's power in that moment. These disciples here on this ship, all they seen was their woes, their trials, their sorrows, their heartache were about to die. And when they seen God come upon the scene and do a mighty work, after they cried out, after they waited so long, when they, when they seen God do this mighty work, it wasn't about the storm no more. It wasn't a, a round of applause saying, yay, he calmed the storm, yay. I'm sure their hearts said that. But it was this pause. They were awestruck. They were now even more afraid. This, is, this word fear here is different than the word we seen fear earlier. This word fear here is where we get our word phobia from. They were, they were frantic. What manner of man is this? Brothers and sisters, do you know what overcomes fear in this life? Fear of our Lord. We know what overcomes the troubles of this life when we realize who is in our presence. And you know what else overcomes a lot of fear in this life? When we realize who presence we are in. We don't have no right to question God. What are you doing? The only rights that we have is to turn to him, to cry out to him. Don't wait till things get bad and trust that the master of the storm has the ability to bring peace in your life. And if you don't get the peace as fast as you want, then trust that God is trying to show you something even deeper, to draw you even closer to the Lord. We should never lift up a storm in our life in a place that to say, this thing has destroyed me. This storm in my life has ruined me. When you do that, you have failed to view this storm from the Lord's perspective. The Lord's words would be to us today when we go through the things, or maybe there's things in your own personal life. Why are you so afraid? When you get so anxious and worked up in these situations that you go through, why are you so afraid? Realize that fear, 
the Lord draws this parallel here. Why are you so afraid? Don't you have any faith? Realize that is exactly what the problem is in our own personal lives. As you go through this journey, as we serve the Lord, as we're on this journey to the other side, any time that you allow something in this life to stress you out, to cause you to have anxiety, to get so anxious, it's solid source. It's number one source is this. You have a lack of faith. That's what Jesus said. Disciples, where is your faith? Brothers and sisters, this is the challenge in our own personal lives to get deeper. And that when we're in the storms, not to wait to cry out to the Lord, but to cry out immediately, to draw nigh to him, to, to hear his voice, to, to draw our attention and to cry out to the one who we see he is. If we really believe it, then cry out. Don't wait. Don't wait to see if a storm will destroy you. Don't wait to see if a storm will ruin you. Don't wait to see if a storm will stress you out. It will. The answer from the storm didn't come from the disciples getting to the other side because of their bravado, because of their experience. They got to the other side because they cried out to the master of the storm. You'll weather your storms when you cry out to the master of it. And how are you going to cry out to the master of it when you're not exercising your faith? If you believe who he says he is, like we do, then we're going to cry out to him because of the great faith that we have in him. Let's pray. Our gracious heavenly Father, Lord, I thank you for this morning, Lord. I thank you for your word, Lord. Strengthen our faith in you, Lord. Strengthen us in your word, Lord, that we may draw an eye to you, Lord. May we be reminded and astonished and awestruck about the power that rests in you, Lord, and that you're with us every step of the way, and that there's not a moment in time that we're apart from you, Lord, and that we realize today, Lord, that when we're in these situations, that though we may be fearful, and that though we may be anxious and troubled, Lord, at times, Lord, that peace comes from you, Lord. May we be reminded, Lord, that every step of this journey, you promised that you would be with us, Lord. What do we have to fear? No matter how bad it is, no matter how bad the diagnosis, even if it is like the disciples believe, Lord, that this very trouble or trial will take my life. Lord, we truly have nothing to fear because of who our faith rests in. Lord, I give great thanks to you for all that you've done. Lord, we pray that you continue to do your mighty work here, Lord. Bless the Witten Place Baptist Church, Lord. Give us a heart of outreach, Lord. We pray that you'll save the sinner, Lord, today and draw them nigh to you. We give you great thanks for all that you've done. In Jesus' name, amen. Hymn number 487. Hymn number 487.